Okay. Um, good afternoon. I have to lean, sorry. Uh, so we'd like to begin, as always, um, by acknowledging that here in Milwaukee, we live on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes. On these lands, the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet, and the human and non-human people of Wisconsin, sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We're grateful to live and work alongside all of the diverse inhabitants of this place. So before I introduce Courtney Baker, I want to invite all of you to join us after her talk on the ninth floor of Curtin Hall for refreshments and continued conversation. Also, I want to remind you of next week's talk by Kavita Daya, uh, titled Graphic Migrations, Hannah Arendt, Statelessness, and South Asia Across Media at 3.30 in this space. Professor Daya will also host a brown bag seminar on a piece of her work at noon on the ninth floor. Please join us at one or both of those events. Thanks. So Courtney Baker is a brilliant scholar of black studies, film and visual studies, African-American literature, and critical theory. She received her PhD from Duke University's program in literature in 2008. That same year, she became an assistant professor at Connecticut College, where she was tenured and promoted to associate professor in 2014. From 2016 to 2019, she was associate professor of American Studies at Occidental College, where in 2017, she co-founded and was named director of the Black Studies program there. She's currently a visiting scholar at Emory University's James Weldon Johnson Institute, Next year, she'll join the UC Riverside English Department as an associate professor. Courtney's first book, Humane Insight, looking at images of African-American suffering and death, is sadly as relevant in today's era of intensified white supremacy as it was when published in 2015. Her current book project, Tyranny of Realism, 21st Century Blackness and the End of Cinema, of which I believe today's talk will be a part, speaks directly to concerns that continue to be central to our work at C21. Indeed, I first met Courtney at the C21 Ends of Cinema conference in 2018, where she delivered a paper that shares a title with her current book project. Courtney Baker is a theoretically complex thinker a clear writer, and a powerful speaker. I look forward to today's talk, as I'm sure you do as well. Please join me in welcoming back to C21, Courtney Baker. Thank you so, so much. It's, um, it's a tremendous honor to be back at C21, which um, for me, when I was here in 2018 for the conference on the ends of cinema, I felt like the conference already had my number in the title. Um, and it also felt like a certain homecoming for me in the sense that I felt really embraced by a number of media and film scholars. Um, and that's been really encouraging. And I've felt similarly encouraged by this visit. So um, thanks to all of you who have shared your afternoon. Um, thanks also um, to, I express gratitude for everyone who Richard already mentioned and to Kyle, Maureen, Richard, uh, Mallory, Leah, um, folks who came to the lunch talk. Um, it's. A, a real gift to be able to share work and to have people's attention. So I don't take that uh, for granted. So thank you. Um, and I would like to dedicate my remarks today, which have shifted. And I'm still so apologize to Nassim, who designed a beautiful poster. Um, I'm not going to be talking about Selma, because I wanted to talk about something 
even more 21st century specific, I can give you the rundown, my reading on Selma. It really is a feminist film. There are lots of women in it in domestic spaces. That's a talk, okay. But this talk <laughs> has a new title, um, particularly the post colon bit, Framing Black Performance, Looking Back and Looking Forward. And I dedicate this to my student, Jaden Burris. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to sharpen my thoughts regarding black cinematic representation through the lens of the 21st century. As I prepared these remarks with this center specifically in mind, what was brought forward was the need to look to prior lessons about representation in film in order to bring them into an even more cinematically determined present. I've been continuing to think about the work of black images and of imaging blackness as a form of work. I had initially planned to present to you research that bridged my earlier interests in the visualization of black suffering with my newer work on the cinematic imagining of blackness. And I'm still going to kind of do that, but with a little bit of a, a twist. I've found myself recently stymied by a confluence of things, including a month of gray skies. I'm in Atlanta, not LA. Everything is fine in LA. Um, or, you know, LA is LA, at least skywise. So there's been a month of gray skies. There's the invasion of the sovereign Wet'suwet'en territories up north to extract yet more finite resources the party line absolution of a rogue administrator in the lower 48, the slow unroll of Brexit, the ongoing incarceration and separation of children and families on the southern US border, the fires in Australia, the vitriol and cynicism of the US Democratic presidential campaign, the increasing drought in Southern California, the COVID-19 pandemic, the addiction epidemics, and the now reliable recurrence of gun violence in Germany, in London, and now here in Milwaukee. I was invited here to the Center for 21st Century Studies, I think, to say something about blackness, visual culture, and the present moment, or better, the future. In the midst of these circumstances, it has been hard for me, I confess, to think about the future, as I imagine it has been for many of you as well. Even in preparing these remarks, I looked back at what I had read and had said about these subjects, hoping that a remixing of prior claims and artifacts might produce, or at the very least inspire, something new. I was intrigued then to discover during my class, which I'm currently teaching on African American film after 1967, that others were looking back as well for new insights. I prepared for a discussion of 1989's Do the Right Thing, a film that screened black rage to a nation primed for the colorblindness that then President Ronald Reagan sought to enforce through rollbacks of affirmative action policies won in the wake of the civil rights movement and of black power. I had hoped in that class to invite my students into a productive debate that I admit I expected to resolve with an embracing of both positions as to whether the film was formalist or realist, even as I acknowledge that I'm even less certain today of what the right thing is. Having screened Do the Right Thing several times for my class and for my own edification, I felt pretty comfortable identifying the film's textual references, its visual and oral citations, and uh, its homages. I know that Radio Rahim's monologue about love and hate was not written for this specific film, and that any indication of love's triumph over hate did not necessarily reference what the right thing was in the world of Do the Right Thing, any more than it did within 1955's Night of the Hunter, the Robert Mitchum vehicle from which the monologue was lifted. Louis Latest. Let me tell you the story of right hand, left hand. It's a tale of good and evil. Hey, it was with this hand that Cain iced his brother. Love. These five fingers, they go straight to the soul of man. The right hand, the hand of love. The story of life is this. Static. One hand 
is always fighting the other hand. And the left hand is kicking much ass. I mean, it looks like the right hand love is finished. But hold on, stop the presses. The right hand's coming back. Yeah, he got the left hand on the ropes now. That's right. Yeah, ooh, it's a devastating right and hate is hurt. Down. Ooh, ooh, left hand hate KO'd by love. I love you. I love you. But if I hate you, there it is, love and hate. I know that some of you have seen this and thought about it, but I think it's always interesting to watch these two clips together. Ah, a little lad, you're staring at my finger. Would you like me to tell you the little story of right hand, left hand? The story of good and evil. H A T E. It was with this left hand that old brother Cain struck the blow that laid his brother low. L-O-V-E. You see these fingers, dear hearts, these fingers has veins that run straight to the soul of man. The right hand, friends, the hand of love. Now watch and I'll show you the story of life. These fingers, dear hearts, is always a warring and a tugging, one again to other. Now watch them. Old brother left hand, left hand hates a fighting. And it looks like love's a goner. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hot dog loves a winning. Yes, sirree. It's love that won. And old left hand hate is down for the count. So, um, yeah, those are almost the same monologues, but with significant differences that you can certainly pick up on, right? One is direct address, another one is intercut um, with this, where the, the viewer is kind of this third party overseeing. Um, and rest in peace, Bill Gunn and Robert Mitchum. So in addition to recognizing um, the affinity of these two clips, this intertextual citation, I knew too that the canted shots and the Dutch angles and the extreme close-ups and tight shots from in Do the Right Thing drew from Lee and his director of photography and fellow Tisch graduate student Ernest Dickerson's screening of Carol Reed's 1949 noir, The Third Man, starring Orson Welles, and that the highly saturated, almost technicolor palette for Do the Right Thing was inspired, at least in part, by the 1947 film Black Narcissus. What I had not foreseen in preparing for this particular class, which happened just a, a few weeks ago, was to screen Lee's inability or perhaps incapacity to recite and flesh out those cinematic references in his own reviewing at the behest of the New York Times Magazine of Do the Right Things Denouement, the end of second act scene in which Rahim is choked to death by the New York NYPD, after an altercation at Sal's Pizzeria, winds up as a racial melee in the middle of a bed street. Hello, everyone. This is Spike Lee, the producer, writer, director of Do the Right Thing. This past June was the 30th anniversary of this film. I know the column is called Anatomy of a Scene. I'm renaming this. I'm calling this anatomy of a murder. The chokehold of Ray Rahim, played by the late great Bill Nunn, my Morehouse brother, was based upon the death of Michael Stewart. In September 1983, Michael Stewart, a graffiti artist, he's about as big as I am. 11 New York City Transit Police jumped on him and strangled our brother to death. That's where I got the idea for the chokehold murder of Ray Rahim. And five years ago, Eric Gardner died the same way that Ray Rahim did in a movie but was based upon the real life chokehold of Michael Stewart. So a lot of things in this film that even though it was written 31 years ago, are still happening today. Black and brown people are still being murdered today by police forces across the United States of America and 
the people who inflict this death walk free. Don't get fired. Don't get suspended. Okay, that's enough of Spike. All right, Lee retitles this particular installment of the New York Times scene discussion, not anatomy of a scene to anatomy of a murder. His alignment is deliberate and seems to repeat the claim that about 30 years ago, Juanima Lubiano, in her essay, But Compared to What, um, cautioned us against which is not to, take Lee's, uh, not to take Lee as the whole cloth arbiter of the truth of a cinematically uh, determined black life. It is not that Lee believes Do the Right Thing is a documentary that is prompting his remarks about how the scene is inspired by both by, by Michael Stewart, but also that it is retrospectively and therefore anachronistically somehow uh, inspired by or inspiring to Eric, the death of Eric Garner, but that he seems to believe that the trajectories and narratives of black life are scripted, if not fated, by cinematic visions of blackness. Now, even as I invite an analysis of Lee's critical commentary, I want to make clear that I am regarding Lee's comments as a text, one amongst many, though uniquely situated in relation to the film's conditions of production and distribution. In other words, I am acknowledging him, though I'm not setting him up as an auteur, but I understand his fundamental and crucial involvement in the construction of the scene. I'm not reinscribing Lee's directorial voice, voice as bearing the final word on the scene in the film, an assumption that would close off rather than open up the considerations that I sought to entertain here. African-American literary and cultural critique Juan Malupiano already outlined the specific problems of ascribing a black cinematic voice to a single director. Considering the hyperinvestment of black film criticism in the voice of Spike Lee to deliver the black reel, Lubiano powerfully critiqued how Lee's dominant directorial presence, quote, empowered by Hollywood's studio hegemony and media consensus on his importance, can function to overshadow or make difficult other kinds of politically engaged cultural work, a pressure to which Lee contributes when he claims to have told the truth, which he is still doing. What I wanted to think about in the wake of this is how black cinema might prove an essential limit case. Hello, everyone. Uh, in disaggregating truth from the image, or to use the language of Stephen Beth, Best, to dematerialize the black visual image so that, to adopt then the language of Kara Keeling, it might erupt into a future unencumbered by dictates of survivability and functionalism. What if the black image was exhausted rather than overdetermined by the specter of immiseration? What if the black image was so replayed that its distortions were brought, were brought into high relief, the image itself degraded into abstractions, dematerialized and impossible? The recognition of African Americans' uniquely complicated relationship to the truth about their experiences <coughs> underwrites all films depicting African American subjects and aspects of African American life. African American cinema confronts the idealism of documenting reality in a significantly charged way. In this, black film takes to heart Alan Sakula's caveat that the truth of the photographic image is only real insofar as it is an ideological encoding of photographic discourse. That maintains that the photograph, this is quote, the photograph is seen as a representation of nature itself. The medium itself is considered transparent. This critical suspicion this view inspires today amongst black and non-black film viewers has been aided in recent years by the proliferation of digital photography and enhancement software. More and more viewers and filmmakers alike resist confusing the real, that is the authentic and actual experiences of people in the world with realism, an aesthetic regime that offers a simulacrum of real experiences in accordance with the established codes of the realist genre. As Phyllis Klotman and Cutler uh, explain in their introduction to the collection Struggles for Representation, Quote, although many film and video makers embrace the real as a way of expressing their own truths, it is important to recognize that realism is a style influenced by the demands of a genre, just as truth is both a personal and collective 
construct influenced by political and historical factors. It is this last element, truth, that renders the African-American film project unique and political in its endeavors. Even if we accept the subjective nature of truth and consequently diminish the authority of, tr of claims made in its name, we must nevertheless admit that the history of African-American identity has been fundamentally shaped by the disconnect between others' truths about African-Americans and African-Americans' truths about ourselves. African-American artists and filmmakers engaged in acts of self-expression have often figured what we might call homegrown truths to successfully combat racist caricatures and other prejudices that have degraded black self-determination. To point out that a notion of truth has been employed and deployed by African-American filmmakers, endeavoring to depict informed viewers of black life on screen should not suggest that these filmmakers are deluded, uh, deluded, uninformed, or obstinate resistors of critiques of realism and photography's truth effect. The presumption of truth is a burden disproportionately allocated to non-white, and in particular, black representation in film. As black film scholars Michael Boyce Gillespie and Kara Keeling have adeptly shown, quote, black film does not and cannot satisfy identitarian fantasies of black ontology. Even though our finely honed post 20th century cinematic perception involved in the production and reproduction of social reality itself repeatedly responds by insisting upon the reality of the representation. Looking for even more forebears who are considering this question, um, I found Stuart Hall asking in the essay, Cultural Identity and Cinematic Representation, is that which drives new forms of visual and cinematic representation only a matter of unearthing that which the colonial experience buried and overlaid, bringing to light the hidden continuities it suppressed? Or is a quite different practice entailed not the rediscovery, but the production of identity. Not an identity grounded in the archeology, span but in the retelling of the past." End quote. In these juxtaposed questions, Hall's language of decolonial excavation itself gives way to invention. The stores of the archive are acknowledged, but remain enshrined, or better, perhaps entombed, not just opaque, but concealed, to give way to the guesswork, the work of imagination. It is not that the archive is non-existent, nor is it inaccessible. It is that it can only be accessed through imaginative connections rather than through some authentic contact with history. Indeed, it is the role of the archive that might best define the operations of the black cinematic. Following Jacques Derrida's interpretation of the ideology of the archive, the testimonies of black subjects once archived become, quote, at once institutive and conservative, revolutionary and traditional. It is this recalcitrant archive that Stephen Best, frustrated by the history-bound orientation of a dominant strain of black studies, acknowledges when he writes that he is, quote, inspired to craft a historicism that is not melancholic, but accepts the past's turning away as an ethical condition of my desire for it. As a strategy, I try to reframe the jolt of the archive, its refusal, its rebuff, as a call to sacrifice, seeing no reason not to put such failure to some use. Hall's skepticism about the transformative, redemptive powers of the archive, reflected by Beth's acceptance of its refusal, is provocative. Working his way through Frantz Fanon's propositions about decolonization, Hall interrogates and troubles some touchstones of the black decolonial project. Hall characterizes the desires of post-colonial societies thusly. The rediscovery, this is a quotation, the rediscovery of cultural or national identity is often the object of what Frantz Fanon once called a passionate research dictated by the secret hope of discovering beyond the misery of today, beyond self-contempt, resignation, and abjuration, some very beautiful and splendid era whose existence rehabilitates us both in regard to ourselves and in regard to others. 
But Hall goes on to caution that, quote, we cannot and should not for a moment underestimate or neglect the importance of the act of imaginative rediscovery. Cultural identity is a matter of becoming as well as of being. It belongs to the future as much as to the past. I see Hall's reflections mirrored, if not elaborated, in some of the future-bound work of black studies in our current moment. And that's really what I wanted to focus on, the future-bound work. At present, there is within black studies a significant focus upon historical study and sociological examination. This orientation proposes to address more broadly not only past events, but the current discourse around African American and black life as a continually unfolding narrative populated and plotted by the persistence of enslavement, exception, and exclusion in an African American and black symbolic order. In None Like Us, which you can tell I'm fascinated by, Best characterizes this insistence upon what he terms a history of subjection as a peculiar malady of black studies. He calls it the omnipresence of history in our politics. More recently, the independent London-based writer and researcher Kevin Ochenga Koth authored a scathing, I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was scathing uh, online essay entitled The Flatness of Blackness that called to task Afro-pessimist thought, including especially the theories of Orlando Patterson, Frank Wilderson, and Jared Sexton, for ordaining, quote, anti-black violence as the structuring regime of the modern world. Black studies, and in particular Afro-pessimism's focus on the ontology of blackness, is crucially informed by, if not, as Okoth argues, deceptively overdetermined by, the invention of blackness as a predisposition towards enslavement that marks the inception of the modern, but is itself marked by a predisposition towards the new world, to settler colonialism, to accumulation, and to extraction. Within this modern temporality, the African continent, Okoth bemoans, is yet again consigned to an unincorporable prehistory or refigured as the raw material for the modern condition, a subject of colonization, capitalism, and the violence that facilitates those new world orders. On the opposite shores of the Atlantic, Best revisits the thought of black Puerto Rican Arthur Schomburg and his early 20th century calls for black community. Specifically, Schomburg's insistence that, quote, the American Negro must remake his past in order to make his future, to spur a redemptive mastery of the pre-slavery past for the purpose of exceeding those conditions and entering into a limitless future. Schomburg made that prescription in 1925, in the very same year that Elaine Locke published his Peon to the New Negro, whose distinctiveness from the old Negro, who Locke euphemizes variously as aunties, uncles, and mammies, and Uncle Tom and Sambo, surpasses isolation and provincialism so that he, the new Negro, might sharpen, quote, his poetry, his art, his education, and his new outlook to produce the promise and warrant of a new leadership. Sidestepping Locke's urgent call for leadership, Schomburg's recommendations to instrumentalize history resound with the later call made in 1970, made by Ghanaian Amilcar Cabral to recruit native culture, by which he means the organic relationships within the indigenous African population and between that population and its environment to achieve national liberation. While those relationships I find desirable, I'm not certain that they must be enacted through a repurposing of the past, especially when that past comes to us through archives established to enshrine our marginalization. As Sadia Hardman has shown in her consideration of the woman she calls Black Venus, bringing a Black historical figure into view means not merely an authentic access to our ancestors, but a replaying of the scenes of subjection that brought them into our present view. As Toni Morrison cautions in Beloved, it is not merely the historical figure that can be made to emerge into the present, but the spectacle and affect, in other words, the cinematic aspects of that figure who carries into the present, and if we are not careful, into the future, the great weight of history and the closed logics of its conditions. 
Kara Keeling, in her magnificent new book, it really is magnificent, Queer Times, Black Futures, considers the cinematic specifically and recruits Edward Glissant's liberationist promise of opacity to recalibrate the function of black cinematic critique. She writes, quote, retaining the opacity of certain cinematic images therefore offers one way to enhance the queer temporalities within the cinematic. It stalls, however momentarily, recognition of those images according to existing systems of evaluation and commensuration, end quote. Now there's a lot to parse in Keeling's comment, not the least of which is how she's mobilizing the concept of queer. Um, I'm gonna bracket that for now, but we can talk about that. For now, let me just offer that what Keeling is resisting here is the institutionalized desire to make visible, to recenter, and to normalize those who have discursively and actually occupied the margins of power, knowledge, and thought. By her own writing, she, quote, underscores the complicity of critical endeavors with this unequal calculus of visibility distribution, recognizing that her own endeavor to fix the black queer in space-time might advance her own position and that which we call knowledge, but does little, if anything, to speculate as to the moment when the black queer might be both visible and safe from harm. So can we conceive of, let alone construct, a future of cinematic blackness that enters the realm of the image without the specter of harm? I do not mean images of a black phantasmagoria, an old image that is relocated or delocated into a newly accessed reel in which wrongs are undone or mitigated. I do not mean an alternate storyline, a dystopian or utopian alter destiny that is nevertheless rooted in the certitudes of narrative and, insofar as they require location, rise from the ashes of a defiled Southern California, as in Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, or on the terraformed colony of Saturn, as Sun Ra would have it in Space is the Place. Instead, I am challenging us to imagine an image that does not bridge the abyss of knowing and unknowing wherein what is perceived is automatically annexed as knowledge to serve the mission of we dare not ask who. What if blackness only existed as future thought? What if it never looked back like Orpheus, trusting that others were following into the future and into freedom? What if the look back wasn't for that which was recognizable and familiar, but for that which is strange, even obsolete, is the obsolete more visible when it performs its own look forward like Melier's voyage to the moon or Rahim's staged death? To underscore and possibly illustrate this hope, I want to close with commentary by the artist and filmmaker Arthur Jaffa, who identifies in the so-called bad ephemeral cinematic image a new ethos for black art as moving, reflective, and strategically uninterested in its designation as art. It's a video, you know, that you know you can find on YouTube. I just stumbled on it. <laughs> it's complicated, like who the artist is. I guess you could say the subject of the video is the Thomas Whitfield Choir. Thomas Whitfield is a very successful gospel composer. The soloist is Latera Wooten, who's really an incredible vocalist. But I'm not sure, per se, that that's the artwork. The artwork, in a sense, is this sort of largely unauthored document of a performance. It's, on one hand, a document of the black community at a very particular time in history. There's one guy who has this incredible hairstyle. Then they do these cutaways of people just doing the move. You know, strange kind of gesture or something. So it's like fascinating to me, this whole tension between whether something is authored or in fact not authored. It definitely tips over into like bad photography, bad video, and despite that, still expressively powerful. I'm very, very interested in this question, let's say, just of legitimacy, because I think 
You know, for black folks, the question of legitimacy is like a fundamental, almost existential question. Oscar Michaud, you know, who is sort of the Louis Armstrong of black cinema, uh, made, depending on who you ask, 30 feature films between 1918 and the mid-50s. Films oftentimes characterized as being poorly done. I would say, well, if you do something one time, it's an accident. If you do it twice, it's a coincidence. But if you do it three times, it's culture, right? And the Thomas Whitfield piece certainly exists as a high bar of how I would like to think about my own work, you know? I mean, I'm declaring it to be art, but I don't actually think it cares whether it's art or not. Increasingly, that's how I want to make work. I want to make work that's sort of, you know, it's not even trying to operate inside of, like, what anybody else thinks about them, positively or negatively. Uh, and that video, in fact, definitely does. So, to kind of sum up, and <laughs> I was really delighted to find this clip from Arthur Jaffa, who, as some of you know, is a very, very well uh, regarded uh, cinematographer conducted the cinematography on um, Daughters of the Dust most famously, but has been consistently working ever since then, since the late 90s. Um, and as recently, he's, he's collaborated with Virgil Abloh and the fashion designer and um, has created, he's almost like a visual hoarder. He's created these kind of montage videos um, that are often screened in um, museum spaces, so non-theatrical spaces, and are often accompanying those are binders of magazine images that he has assembled without any kind of introduction or direction um, into a very fat binder that one can then uh, flip through. And I found myself um, gratified by finding this clip because what I was really trying to tangle with is the ephemeral and the impossible, which are the things that I've been reading, particularly in Stephen Best and in Kara Keeling, that have been giving me hope in this moment where, um, like Spike Lee, I am inclined to see in the image something that I already know but that I don't want affirmed. So I am grateful for this idea of, of the ephemeral, of the clip uh, that is art or could be art, but doesn't particularly seem to care whether or not it is art, but is powerful and it is very, very black. Um, what I wanted to think through, what I wanted to hope for, is the unincorporable image, the affective and intellectual opposite of the scene of Radio Rahim's death, the image that resists reduction to the knowable, to memification, to disclosure, to a predictable outcome, to the seeming victory of the singular episode made universally resonant. I want the irreducible, the irreplaceable, the scene not prescripted by fate for myself and for my students I want a future worth waiting for. Thanks. So as you can probably tell, this is very early, kind of like affective, rough work, trying to think hard thoughts through some text and in a particular moment. Um, so there are certainly gaps that I would be happy to fill in. Do you want to call on people, or do you want help in that? Oh, um, I, you, I'll defer. I'm happy to call okay. people in. I think the mics are back. Are we miking? Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you uh, very much for your talk. Um, I find it interesting that you uh, began with Spike Lee and ended with Arthur Jaffa, <laughs> given that Arthur Jaffa shot Spike Lee's Crooklyn. Mm -hmm. But, um, you, know, you know, with Do the Right Thing, what I find interesting is um, the way in which, you know, 
in addition to the performance of the characters on screen, there's the performance of film language. Mm -hmm. um, both, you know, I would say in the academic context, we would say that Spike Lee is citing um, other filmmakers, um, examples of other film movements. But if you want to talk about Do the Right Thing as a document of black youth culture, particularly hip hop culture, we would change the word from citing to sampling. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you could also, you know, talk about that in the context of the film that um, Arthur Jaffa shot for Julie Dash, uh, Daughters of the Dust, you know, giving this uh, contemporary presentation of black people in, you know, that, in a story that takes place in the, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, as I think about citing and sampling previous work to comment on the present, I'm, you know, I'm also trying to tie this in, um, you know, what you say that, you know, you're talking about future bound work and you're also talking about blackness only existing as future thought. And I'm just curious to, um, you know, think to hear what you have to say about the function of, um, you know, citing sources, um, you know, in a scholarly context and even like sampling in an artistic context to not only comment on the contemporary, but also to present um, the type of future we would like to see. Um, blackness existing as blackness and not ex and its existence not depending on anything else. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, so I wasn't using the term sampling. I was thinking about remixing, um, which I, th though I think sampling works, particularly for do the right thing. And as you were talking about, about the distinction between citing and sampling or remixing, um, it brought to mind a very strange conversation that I had with somebody who worked in a digital innovation lab. And I, I, I was explaining that, um, you know, that, that do the right thing and other Spike Lee films do engage in this politics of citation. And he proposed, he said, wouldn't it be interesting if you could teach an AI to just do that? And I thought, who would want to watch that? Um, like a, like a computer-generated citation of every great Italian-American director film. Like, why would, you want, why would you want that? So there is something, there's something about the choice, right? And the selectivity and... <sighs> Is it the affect of it or the, um, the, the disposition of it, right? Um, that, that is what we seek in the cinematic that I don't think is something that we would want from an AI per se. Um, in, and what was I gonna say about that? What was the talking about? Oh, the politics of citation. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm really intrigued by and trying to kind of occupy, or, or not occupy, is to resist the lure of capitalist lures of property, of accumulation. And I'm getting a lot of this because I see it very nicely enacted in Keeling's book, but I, but I see it in other places. I think it's also there in the way that Best writes about the, the dematerialization, dematerialization of the art object, even though he doesn't call it that. That's what Lucy Lepard calls it that, right? Um, and I think in general in conversations about, about trash and about use and about using up and an understanding of um, if we're talking about enslavement, we're talking about human resources. I, I want to think about a, and I hope, I hope I practice, a citation that really does directly point to that scholarship rather than enhances my own value. Um, I think that that is, and I think I think that we've seen there are some versions of that and some practices of that, like um, the recurrence of the roll call that we see in a lot of, in particular, um, black feminist, African American feminist work of the 1960s and 70s. Um, but that resistance to 
that resistance to, to kind of accumulate and to functionalize and to instrumentalize in order to, to get over, right? Um, I think, th I think that's, that's where it's at. And I'm trying to think about that for my students in terms of education, where how can I, it, there, it's, new, it's new folks every year, it's a new day, it's a new hour. What, what, what new is there to tell them when the future is very, I feel like the future is very uncertain these days. Um, and I don't, I, I worry. I won't even say I don't want. I worry about an image, a scene like the death of Radio Rahim, continually circling, encircling the, the, the drain of its real world reference, right? The death of Michael Stewart, the death of Eric Garner. Um, I'm also worried about getting so far away from it that I'm like, look, it looks like the third man. That's great. Um, so somewhere between, somewhere between um, immiserating accumulation and just a stylistic accumulation, I think is 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 where I'd like to see this kind of practice going. That helps. Okay, I was totally going. Whoa, that was loud. Sorry. Um, I was totally going to ask a question about the status of the document, but instead, oh. you okay. used a word that makes me so excited, which is accumulation, um, and that's something I've been thinking about uh, so much too, especially in terms of um, how uh, identities are structured via digital culture, right? Um, and so, in thinking about the the term accumulation, it makes me think about how this talk in many ways is also a resistance to the politics of taste, right, and hierarchies of taste. And that's so beautifully summed up at the end by Arthur Jaffa talking about how it's not about good taste, right? It's about, um, it's about upending the question of what stands as a proper archival document and what can be um, circulated in different kinds of um, cultural celebration, well, celebration is not the word I want to use, but like in different kinds of, um, I don't know, different kinds of like cultural, intellectual ways of being in the world. So I guess it's less of a, com of a question than to just say, I'm so glad you used that term accumulation, and I want to see so much of that term um, in uh, the rest of this work as it emerges. Thanks. Thanks. I'm really heartened to hear that. And, I'm, and it, I feel like this is part of what I want to get away from is like, I have bad news in, in terms of to respond to that, because it reminds me um, this one doesn't involve AI. Um, but in terms of what is happening in the archive and who the archivists are, um, something that I'm still grappling with that I find that I found deeply disturbing. And the little work that I did in that I have done um, in African American collecting, um, I was looking at a catalog, and it wasn't a specifically African American collector, but first problem was that this was the collection of African Americana, and it included clan ephemera. Um, and I was like, that's not African Americana. I know why you think so, but that's not right. That's not, that's not right. Um, the second issue, the second thing that was in there were a few family photo albums. Um, and they were described of African American family photo albums spanning from like the 1920s to like the 1990s. And they were described. Uh, they were described as being really remarkable. They cost like they were being priced at a two thousand dollars, and they looked just like my family albums. And I could recognize that they were being circulated. That they had probably been picked, right after uh, um, like a house sale, and then they were being circulated um, in in a in a in a very non-black uh, private collector and rare book environment. And so the value of documents, images of black life um, were not even visible to those populations and those peoples who were being whose images were being bought and sold. Um, which is disturbing to me because like the accumulation can happen without your knowing, 
right? Um, and then it's, it, it, it is the, 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 the logic of one man's trash is another man's treasure. And to recognize how that plays out and how institutions are complicit Right, and and our functions are complicit, right? As as researchers and as scholars, or just as interested people, um, that we the 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 move to accumulate is is so naturalized, um, and yeah, I think I think it's it's going to take a lot of work um, to get out of that. And I don't think it's serving us well, and I don't think it's sustainable for the entire planet. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm Tammy Williams. I'm yeah, a colleague Jocelyn's, and I think we met at the end of <laughs> cinema conference. It's great to have you back. Um, I actually had a comment, but it changed as I was listening to your question. <laughs> Because I really love this idea of what you're talking about with the archive, and um, my question is ultimately, can, how can we think of an archive for the future? Not of the past, but for the future. I, um, I was, my initial question had, or initial comment, I guess, had to do with the excitement I felt as I tried to squeeze in an hour of grading before coming here um, in my digital media class. And one of the students was writing about um, Black Panther mm -hmm. and thinking about uh, digital realism and effects in relation to cultural heritage. And so I brought in something about Afrofuturism or the, the intersection of African diaspora culture and technology um, as um, as it relates to technology and subject positions and thinking about how, and I ask them, how can we relate this to some of our earlier readings on media and technology around fear and alienation and utopic aspirations? So that was my comment to the students. And I was really excited because it's a course on cinema and digital culture. And I was like, wow, OK, they're thinking about this. And how do, how do I use this to get them to think more, you know, about the present and about things that, you know, beyond just, you know, rereading these digital media texts and uh, and at the same time, uh, when you're talking about accumulation, accumulation, I was thinking about because Richard was standing up there about premediation, right? Uh, and like, how many times can you rewatch something and doesn't it end up being emptied of its content and so I, I really love what you're talking about, and and and, uh, but I guess my question um, comes back to uh, this question of the archive. Um, myself being an archival historian, uh, mostly uh, looking at early women filmmakers, uh, I find it so fatiguing. I have like archive fatigue, but I also have people <laughs> fatigue. And uh, I'm organizing a retrospective on an early woman filmmaker at the Cinémathèque Française. And after 20 years of writing on this, they put the announcement for the the, the retrospective. How they put it that her career ended in 1927 because of her relationship to the surrealist poet Artaud, and like as if a surrealist movement could kill someone's entire career that was well beyond and much bigger than that. But that the Cinémathèque Française recirculates these narratives constantly. And they're the home of the archives, the film archives. I just was so furious this week. I just don't even know like what to do, because I also am preparing a talk. <laughs> and I'm like, where do we go? Where does this? There's an accumulation, but there's also uh, there's a fatigue of there's a fatigue of Being, having to retell the narratives that don't have an effect. So then we have to come up with new narratives. And how do we do that? And I'm so inspired by what you're doing. So thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry thank for the long comment. And thank. Well, it was a really helpful comment. Thank you. Um, 
I think that you're right that um, that what those of us when we're engaging in archival work I feel like Sp Gayatri Spivak said a version of this in Can the Subaltern Speak um, which wasn't about instrumentalizing our or instrumentalizing the voice of the sub subaltern in order to advance our wonderful careers as academics or as acad activists or as feminists um, but also that that work of making legible or, or, or translatable or accessible. Um, and I'm in general a fan and in principle of accessibility, but that there can also be a certain aspect of violence to that, which is interesting too, since you brought up Black Panther, which actually begins at the High Museum, or fairly early in the film, it begins at the museum with a kind of liberation of the archive, right? But this idea of restoring vibranium to its proper place. And there's, there's an echo in the real world that we're seeing. Um, particularly, there was about, I guess, six months ago, a big conversation in France. And this has been on, ongoing. Um, but discussions about, about deaccessioning objects and about repatriation. And what has emerged are, are, are conversations about, about those institutions and about whose knowledge is being valued, right? Because uh, I think one of the, the arguments, it was a very weak argument about repatriating um, the sculptures from ben that were taken from Benin um, was, but they're, they're being cared for in a museum now that is open to the public. And folks were like, well, they're not open to an African public unless you can get to France. So, um, so, so I think, so I th I'm not sure that re-narration is, a solution, but it, I think attending to that desire or to attending to those desires and those impulses to correct, to repatriate or to re-narrate um, with an eye towards, right, if we're not escaping ideology, then what other kind of institutions and, and principles might be being shored up by my, my work. Um, yeah, this is this is not like a happy conclusion, but but um, I think the only way out is through, and I really am, and you can probably tell that I'm really am trying to think to something, to something else, to something better, um, especially as a scholar, um, when I'm like not in this to get a summer house. Like that's not why I do this. Um, so then what 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 can be the relationship that I that I that I engage in with my community and with my environment? Thank you, Richard. Uh, I had a question so you want to create alternative to this archive that's really locked away from people that are actually the archive is about. So how hard is it for you as a scholar, as an intellectual, to connect yourself with grassroots movements, or well, not even grassroots movements, but grassroots organizations, and to start creating those alternative archives and, and or start creating amateur archivists, and so they'll have the ability to start teaching people like, oh, this is the point of this work. And all the archive material isn't just for culture vultures to chew on. Um, I think part of why I wanted to include Spike Lee's clip is precisely because he's, I mean, maybe he's a culture vulture, but he's, he's, he's a vulture of his own yeah. archive. Um, so, so that for me was like a big warning sign, right? That it's not that it's not just the dynamic of the outsider coming in and 
harvesting um, the valuable property and taking it away. That it's that it can happen within a community, and perhaps it has something to do with with a particular investment in a kind of functionalism, right? Or an instrument, an instrumentality, right? That. Um, That, that is closed, that, that has a kind of closed logic. Like this can only be access, accessed if it's going to be used for this, if it's only, um, not if it's only going to be stay here. I, I, I think that those are the questions that you're asking are the questions that I'm in fact trying, trying to think through. Um, and, yeah, um, does being a scholar make me not a community member? You no, know, I, know, I know you didn't, but, I th but it's a, a question. I think it's a worthwhile question, because it, it, it can in some ways, and it, it might not in some ways. And so it's my job to think through the ways in which that could, that could happen. I hope I can turn this into a question. Um, I am, I'm, I'd, I'd like to ask you to help us think about endings. Um, and I'm thinking about the endings of some of the films that you've been talking about. And um, I guess I'll frame that with Du Bois's insistence mm -hmm. that um, all art is propaganda and mm -hmm. should be. So. Well, he doesn't say should be. Well, OK. <laughs> I'll take that back. Is there a particular pressure on African American cinema to tell us what the future is and to give us endings that in one way or another address that? And within our gates, you know, Michaud does sample uh, Birth of a Nation and various kinds of uplift movement narratives. And then ends the film with this kind of ambiguous but uh, uplift narrative scene, which is supposed to point towards uh, a future that is imaginable by making reference to an historical event you know, from the Philippine War, which is strangely unimaginable. Then we leap forward to Daughters of the Dust, which has one of the strangest or queerest temporalities of, of, of any film, um, where um, we're always throughout the film on the edge of the future. We're with this whole group of people who have been put on the edge of the future. We have technical scenes of glimpses of, of what that future is, but um, we, we will never know what what it actually is is going to be, although we do know what happened after that. So it's it's that's very strange. And then the end of do the right thing, it doesn't yeah. imagine. I mean, do you see that imagining any kind of future? So do we write the the filmic history of 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 black cinema as an always already no future history? And is, is that the only right thing we can do? I hope not. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm intrigued by the, by the linking of uplift cinema to Afrofuturism. I, I want to keep thinking through that, um, which is not to say that I think all of Afrofuturism is uplifting, right? Um, though it is speculative. Um, I, I, think, I think what's intriguing about Daughters of the Dust, and I think Daughters of the Dust is a little bit different than the way that, that say, Do the Right Thing ends. Do the, well, Do the Right Thing ends with, it seems like nothing has changed. It's like the end of Heathers, right? Um, they even take 
I know that's a really weird comparison, um, but but there is this sense like this could happen again. The body has been removed, except for the people who remain, who remain and who have this locked within their memories. This could happen again, and it. If, if we expand the purview to the the real the real world, right, it does happen again um, to Eric Garner. Um, I think in Daughters of the Dust, we do have a sense of what happened because it's histor it's a historical film in a way that Do the Right Thing wasn't trying to be at the time. Um, and I see that that film as a cinematic elabor elaboration of the photographic archive, right? Because it has that character who's the photographer. Um, and I, and I, I might suggest that there's a, there's a sense, I might actually take it back. We, we know what happens on the macroscopic level, as in this is, this is the beginning of the progressive era and the lynching campaigns are about to increase. We know this is part of the Great Migration. So we have that macroscopic view of history. But do we know what happens to each of those individual characters? No. And access to the presumptive archive that those photographs um, would constitute the photographs that are taken within the film by the character Sneed, who goes and brings his camera, um, wouldn't necessarily fill that in either, right? Because they, they, won't, they won't necessarily have any more um, to say or more of a narrative attached to them than does the the bundle that the mother that Coralie Day makes, right? Um, that has her hair and has dirt, right? And has all of these all these things in it. So I think um, so is there is is black film lead does it lead inexorably towards no future? Um, no, I don't think that's it. I think it might push the limit case of, to, to use the term that y'all did for the conference, the ends of, of cinema, right? Um, the fantasies of closure, um, and even going back to the, to the remixing and repurpose, repurposing, um, that, that, that something, it's something we were talking about earlier today, something nonlinear. Um, can happen. As a footnote, I, I think that the end of Get Out is, is a successful effort to put an end to certain kinds of narratives in cinemas. Um, and, and I think that's an interesting thing. And I think that the other thing, you know, Schomburg called his essay uh, the Negro digs up his past, mm -hmm. or the past. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be interesting to think about efforts to create an African archive within the project of creating an African American culture, and whether or not, you know, and you see that in Daughters of the Dust with, with the preservation of Gullah memory, uh, that, that that archive is supposed to be a foundational part of the resistance movement. Mm -hmm. But is, is every effort to archive the African an innocent one uh, in these projects, but that's a footnote. Thank you for your talk. I, I didn't get all of it, so if you went over some of these things that I'm going to ask, then mm -hmm. sorry. Um, I was re I'm interested in both the futurity aspect of your talk and also the blackness, mm -hmm. right? So the impossibility of, you know creating a new idea of what blackness is into the future and how Afrofuturism itself plays with that. And I, I guess I had questions about uh, where you could go with this in two ways, because blackness itself, like, is a term, does the term blackness always reinscribe that past, right? Drag it to the present and in, in, into the future, just because of how blackness was formed mm -hmm. out of that violence, right? That violent history. Um, and because I wasn't sure where you were saying where those impossible images can be found or where glimpses of those images 
are being found now. So I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit. Like, yeah. where are those impossible images that don't reinscribe blackness as it is constantly being reinscribed and redefined by the past? Right? How? How? What are those those images or texts that challenge the the future? Challenges a future that just reinscribes that that same trauma, right? Um, of the the birth of blackness through trauma. And I guess the other part of this is I'm an Africanist, and but I'm not I'm not a film person. I'm a folklorist, and as Africanist, I am always wondering about the like when when I hear this talk, I'm thinking, okay, it's a lot of African American. Um, a lot of, of uh, analysis of African American texts and all of this, not not only, but um, so I, I always think of okay, what are the what are is there kind of pan are there pan African futures, right? Are there um, are there you know conversations or connections between different visions and different futures being imagined across the diaspora, and are those in conversation with each other? Um, and is it only in, and, and, and what are the texts that we can draw? Because like me, I'm a folklorist, it's like all, I, I mostly do like oral texts that like talk to people who are, you know, spiritual prophets and they, mm -hmm. tell, they talk about, oh, this is what we envision for the future of this place and for our people, et cetera. But that doesn't become part of a conversation of, you know, people who are circulating, you know, novels about Afro, Afrofuturism or, Necessarily, um, films or anything like that. So I guess I had questions about those those broader connections in the diaspora, and also about the 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 glimpses of the impossible that you may have found in your work. Sure, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. I wrote notes and I broke it into three things. So I'm going to try it. Okay. So are there Pan African futures? Um, <laughs> Wait and see. Um, I can think of one cine uh, one in particular cinematic text, which is that gets labeled Afrofuturism, um, which is the the short film Pumzi, right? Which is the 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 film that everybody c cites. Uh, yeah, it's a great it's a great film. Um, I think that. For, I, I think that as we're hmm, proceeding, there is a challenge to thinking blackness. Um, in in so far as it, in so far as with particular. Traditions of Black studies in the past twenty years, they have circled around enslavement in particular, and produced some quite lovely and useful conceptualizations of, to use Sunra's term, an altered destiny, right? Or of. Um, the notion of fugitivity, or like living in the wake, right, an afterlife. All of those con th those concepts are really generative. I'm not sure of the extent to which those touch the shores of the African continent, and I think that that's um, that's a that's that's a, a challenge. <laughs> that's a problem, really. And I'm also inspired to think not just geographically of the limits of, of a blackness in terms, in terms of geography, but also, um, say, in Tracy K. Smith's poetry, um, in the volume Life on Mars, in which she interrogates what would happen when difference falls away. It's a kind of, you could say, an Afrofuturist volume. And what she ends up kind of um, speculating is that even affect and pleasure fall away. Um, 
because of the kind of frictions of, of difference that are erode that are eroded. Um, and she, without it in front of me, I'm not doing it in any way justice. Um, So I think I think that the the fundamental problem, and this also speaks to the impossibility of locating images, right? Um, and why I used words like de delocate or or degrade or deform, is that if if we understand blackness as a term that is a condition of modernity that is produced that was produced in opposition to whiteness to facilitate a certain uh, instrumentalization and violence against those identified as black then a black future project you're shaking your head no, I'm at it. <laughs> a black future project has to address that that kind of duality, right? Of surviving, can it survive its own destruction, right? If if the invention of the concept of blackness is was was produced as a form of destruction, as a kind of accumulation, right? As a way of inventorying, um, then 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 what comes after that? And for, I'm still working through that. And for me, it's Keeling in her recent book that is the place that I've been going to. And she, I'm trying to remember if she actually talks about the continent some more as well. She does a little bit. Um, but the issue there then becomes the impossible, and in readjusting knowledge as being not about a project of accumulation, um, and trusting that the future will come. This also is getting. This, when I say this out loud, it sounds terrible and hokey, but um, in not investing in resisting in producing a humanity that can that can survive without reinscribing the ordering of the world that it has just that it has just made way for looking for, it's almost like unplanning for a future, right? Like divesting from the, from the future is the way to get to the future, is kind of the program. Mine's a much smaller, maybe more aesthetically minded question anyways, <laughs> but I've been thinking a lot about what you were talking about with Raoul Peck and form in the, in the earlier discussion. And then you're also thinking about these tensions between endings that we've been mm -hmm. talking about and future thinking. Um, and you've also sort of juxtaposed now Spike Lee with Arthur Jaffa, which I think <laughs> is an interesting move, yeah. but I am, it does lead me to wonder, Jaffa and maybe you could think about like Garrett Bradley or some other filmmakers who have turned explicitly to archival materials mm -hmm. and are working with this sort of in media res and resist beginnings or endings um, and how you see those types of filmmakers maybe having a, a unique maybe strategy, historically specific strategy for um, sidestepping a lot of these concerns and questions that we're talking about with maybe older um, films in the canon that we're describing. Older black films in the canon or just yeah, the general exactly. canon? Um, I might say that I might put Symbiopsychotaxoplasm, Bill Greaves' film, in, in there. Um, I think the problem, the difficulty with these films is that they require, in order to, to, to watch them so as not to consume them, we watch, um, is a readjustment of affect because they're not necessarily pleasurable, right? Um, which I think is what 
the, the Tracy Smith poem is getting is getting at, right? Um, yeah. So I th I think I think that there are experiments. I think that <sighs> the way that Stephen Best puts it is that the artwork that returns us to realizing, wow, that's artwork now, but it, it, it's only because someone made that choice. Otherwise, it would be unrecognizable, it would be indistinguishable, um, kind of utilizing a gestalt theory, right? Um, I, think, I think that is, I think there's an ethics, I think there's an ethics in that. Okay. <laughs>